Tyler Thompson. I am a sophomore biology major from Bakersfield, California. Hello, my name is Daniel Okoye, and I'm a sophomore biology major from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And during this TED Talk, we will be discussing the effect of the swim bladder nematode Anguillus crasis on Anguillus rostrata, commonly known as the American eel in the Chesapeake Bay. In 1995, the first account of the swim bladder nematode Anguillus crasis was discovered in the American eel, Anguilla rostrata, in the Chesapeake Bay area. The introduction of this parasite due to the international trade with Europe has led to the reduction in the quantity of American eels able to migrate to spawning waters. This has greatly impacted the commercial eel industry and the overall population of American eels in the Chesapeake Bay. As a result, this has led researchers to study the steady decline of the eel in the Chesapeake Bay area. The American eel is classified under the phyla chordata and belongs to the class of bony fish. Its morphological features include a long slender body that can grow up to five feet long. They are usually a greenish brown color, however color varies with age and habitat. They are covered with embedded scales that are coated with a thick mucus. American eels are one of the very few fish that are canandromous, meaning that they spend most of their life in freshwater but migrate to sea in order to mate. The American eel population typically ranges from Greenland to northern South America, but they spawn in the southern part of the Cerrigo Sea. The Letocephalus larvae migrate northward and eastward through passive drift for about one year before metamorphosizing into glass eels. Eel locomotion is said to be incredibly efficient because of the eel's elevated hydrostatic pressure, which is critical in reduction of its energy usage. This plays a critical role in the spawning migration of the eel because they have to undergo an extensive journey over 5,000 to 7,000 kilometers from the Chesapeake Bay to the Cerrigo Sea. After mating, eel eggs hatch into larvae called glass eels because of their thin transparent skin. These eel larvae can travel up, up to a year to reach the United States coast where they will enter their next stage in development. Most won't survive the journey, but those who do metamorphosize into a new shape, and these eels are called elvers. These adolescent elvers will grow and develop for at least three years before they reach adulthood. Elvers will live upstream in rivers or in brackish waters and bays, and many will live up 20 years before they return to the sea to mate. Like most parasites, Anguillus crassus has a very complex life cycle. When a swim bladder nematode is in its larval stage, it gives a copepod or other crustaceans to eat it and will reside in the gut of the crustacean until it is eaten by a, an American eel. Once inside the eel, the nematode travels up the gut to the swim bladder where it will develop into adulthood. Anguilla crosses originated from Eastern Asia, where it is widespread among its native hosts, the Japanese eel, Anguilla japonica. This parasite was first documented in wild European eagles, Anguilla anguilla, in Germany of 1982, with having spread throughout Europe, infecting almost all of its native species of eels in only two decades. Anguilla anguilla elvers were imported into Japan to compensate for a decline in Japanese elvers, primarily for commercial reasons. Studies have shown that the productivity of European eels in Japanese farms were poor, as eels were found to be susceptible to native parasites, including swim bladder nematodes, such as Anguilla crassus. Many studies supported the fact that an expanding eel trade in Taiwan, China, and Korea had ensured that Anguilla crassus is widely distributed throughout East Asia in Japanese and European eels. According to a study in 2007, it took about one decade for the Anguillus crassus infection to spread over large parts of Europe and more recently North America. Additionally, the study concluded that in a short time, various eel species across the globe became parasitized due to worldwide eel shipments. As stated before, Anguillus crassus is very significant as it has recently spread from its range in the Eastern Pacific to Europe and to North America. It poses a significant threat to the new hosts such as the European eel and American eel. It is said to be the most invasive species of, of the genus, having colonized populations of the different species of eels from Asia, Europe, Africa, and now here in, the, in North America. 
So, does the infection by Anguilla's crasis cause death in the American eel? <laughs> no, silly. Anguilla's crasis infections rarely lead to the death of wild eels. However, in hosts that have succumbed to heavy infections by the nematode often led to hemorrhagic lesions, skin ulcerations, decreased appetite, and a reduction in locomotion efficiency. Other side effects were the accumulation of dead tissue and bloody fluids in the swim bladder. Additionally, a recent study in 2012 hypothesized that a side effect of Anguilla's crisis could trigger psychological mechanisms that could affect the silvering process in eels, which could play a big role in the eel's inability to undergo a long migration. A study in 2009 calculated the mean prevalence of Anguilla's crisis for Chesapeake Bay yellow American eels was 40.2% for juvenile nematodes and 46.1% for adult nematodes. Furthermore, they stated that the co commonality of Anguilla's crosses range from 13% to 82%. Research done in 1994 exhibited a certain number of cases that indicated that a certain degree of adaptation by the parasite to Anguilla species because of their ability to move freely within the host's gas chambers without triggering a reaction. This incognito effect suggests a thickening of epithelial tissue in order to serve as a beneficial protection from an eel's immune system. A recent study shows differences in ineffectivity and development dynamics between European and Taiwanese populations of Anguilla's crosses. Found in the study suggests rapid genetic divergence of this parasite after a successful host switch in Europe. Deprivation of blood to the swim bladder most likely impairs its function to control the buoyancy of the eel. The nematode sucks the blood from the walls of the swim bladder, which gives it them a dark brown to black coloration. So, like a leech? Kinda, but the leech is an ectoparasite, while Anguilla's crosses is an endoparasite. Through further research, we have found that because of the impairment of the swim bladder in the American eel, less of the population would be able to undergo the migration for reproduction. This in turn harms the overall population because the reproduction rate will drop significantly. Oh, so Anguilla's crisis affects the overall population of the American eel by reducing their ability to migrate and reproduce, not by infecting them and causing a timely death. Got it. So, I remember the nematode having some type of an intermediate host. That's right. Anguilla's crisis almost always uses a crustacean as an intermediate host, often a copepod. Copepods are small, numerous, and are found in almost all freshwater habitats that most nematodes are located in. The result of a food analysis done by Wiener and Music in 1975 compared the diets of 31 Chesapeake Bay eels, typically ranging from 14.5 to 29 inches long. Results showed that their diet consisted of crustaceans, annelids, fish, echinoderms, mollusks, and eelgrass. However, it was also found that the diet range of 13 smaller eels consisted of mainly amphipods, isopods, worms, and one containing a siphon of a mollusk. Larger eels are obviously more susceptible to parasitism because of their larger diet. Ah, so the more you eat, the more likely you are to get the parasite. Yes. However, in nature, small eels, as well as larger ones, seem to be infected by Anguilla's crisis. A study in 2009 confirms this, finding that all life stages of eels can become infected by consuming prey that have been infected by parasitic organisms. A study in 1990 shows that eels that have been infested after they reach a length of about 20 centimeters and a weight of 10 grams, frequency of infestation increases. Furthermore, this study notes that the larval stages of the nematode 3 and 4 are also frequently found in the swim bladder of larger eels, mainly because of their greater appetites. This supplies nutrients to the nematodes. A study in 2002 developed an index based on macroscopic criteria to easily assess the health state of the eel swim bladder as a result of infection by the nematode Anguilla's crosses. They too along with sources in a 1990 study, found that eels larger in size had a larger amount of damage 
done to their swim bladders than that of smaller eels. Likewise, another study done in 1994 found that almost all of the eel specimens over 20 centimeters long in length were infected by the worm, proving that there might be a relationship between the eel size and susceptibility to being infected by the parasite. However, according to a study in 2002, patterns have shown that the relationship between the number of parasites in the swim bladder is not directly proportional to the damage done to the swim bladder. A recent study in 2008 suggests that climate may also influence American eel populations. According to the Swim Bladder Index in a 2002 study, seasonal variations were said to have occurred with maximum damage to the swim bladder occurring in July, and afterwards individuals went through a healthy trend. This leads to the discussion of effects of warm and colder climates on the ability of anguillus cresses to infect American eel swim bladders. A study in 2001 done in North Carolina reported that higher infection rates that they observed are related to an increase in warm water periods in southern waters. Furthermore, they hypothesized that this could mean that the exotic parasite could have been introduced to warm water areas before they even got to cold waters. Additionally, they hypothesized that because of the overall infection rate of eels in North Carolina was two times higher than that in the Chesapeake Bay and four to 13 times higher than that in the Hudson River, the North Carolina eels would have a higher infection rate than more northern states. Coming from a different perspective, a study in 1998 assessed the impact of low water temperature on the development of anguillus crasis in the final host European eel. European eels were purposefully infected with the nematode parasite and both were subjected to cold temperatures at 4 degrees Celsius. According to their results, the third larval stage survived a four-month period at 4 degrees Celsius, however, were incapable of invading the swim bladder. Furthermore, adult parasites were subjected to the same temperature and time frame, were severely harmed, reflected in their increased mortality and the decrease in reproduction. According to a study in 1989, the larvae molt in a copepod and reach the third infective stage after 10 to 12 days at 21 degrees Celsius. Worms at larval stages 3 and 4 are able to stay alive at 4 degrees Celsius, but were still temperature dependent when it came to invading necessary organs such as the swim bladder. However, a recent study in 2013 states that it is imperative for worms in larval stages 3 to penetrate into the swim bladder where it develops into larval stage 4 and finally into adults that suck on eels' blood. A recent study done by Hine in 2012 in South Carolina evaluated the success of infection by the nematode parasite and compared the results to other American eels in North America. Interestingly, he found that the swim bladder was actually lower in the summer and that larval intensity was significantly greater in the winter. He hypothesized that swim bladder damage was significantly low because of the extreme heat conditions that South Carolina waters are subjected to. This may be indicating mortality because of the hot water, which means that less O2 would be dissolved in the water. This could mean that there is not a substantial amount of O2 in the water that is needed by anguillus crasis. So Tyler, what have we learned? Well Daniel, we've learned that anguillus crasis increases the stress on a restrata, which leads to the decline in the eel's ability to gain enough fat storage for the long journey to mating grounds. Ultimately, this inhibits the eel's capability to migrate to spawning waters. This, in turn, leads to the steady decline in the population of American eel in the Chesapeake Bay. We also know that research has and is currently being done to show that there is an, a relationship between the length and size of eels and the rate of infection. However, research has also shown that there is a strong correlation between the temperature and the rate of infection. The warming of waters because of global climate change can be one of the leading factors in the global spread of the parasite. Eel populations in the Chesapeake Bay may die out due to the prime changes in climate that provide a seamless habitat for the parasite. I hope you enjoyed our video. My name is Daniel Coy. And I'm Tyler Thompson. Thanks for watching.